pleasure to invite uh, Omri Shlomovitz from uh, Ingoniama um, to talk about uh, CK and NPC game engine, right? Simply passionate about both, and uh, interesting um, intersection that and, and what you can achieve by doing that, by doing so. Specifically in this talk, I'm going to focus on um, on multiple games. Right? So in general, gaming uh, is, uh, is a huge industry, and uh, uh, the biggest uh, chunk of this industry is, is multiple games, right? Online games, and um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk specifically about the problem of, of cheating. So intuitively, you can uh, you can think about you know uh, if, if about some some examples uh, like like running uh, faster than uh, what's possible in a game or um, having some kind of automation like an aimbot, uh, even walking through walls and getting some advantage. Now this is a big problem, right? Uh, and a big problem in uh, uh, an industry worth. Billions of dollars is obviously worth a lot of money. So think about it from the perspective of uh, the game designer and the game publisher. So uh, think about launching a new game to uh, and then like a day after someone finds uh, a way to, to cheat, winning the game. And it happens, right? And then kind of like the game crashes, no one using it and so on. Think about it from uh, the gamer perspective. So. Uh, you do want uh, to have good gaming experience, you want uh, to have fun, and also uh, in a competitive uh, way, now with, with uh, esports, there's also a lot of money uh, at stake, right? So you're going to lose a lot of money. And the problem of cheating is uh, said to be kind of like impossible to solve, and uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to, to tackle it and then try to add more color to. Uh, this kind of uh, possibility, obviously, the bottom line is that there's a trade-off, uh, security, performance, and so on, but we need to address it um, and be more specific. But yeah, in general, it's like a cat and mouse kind of uh, kind of a game. So when we look at the landscape, there's not much of a pile of work. So sure, uh, mental poker is a problem that uh, photographers really like. However, uh, I'm talking a lot about like the AAA games, right? So state-of-the-art, um, fancy games that we play, and. Um, one kind of uh, uh, solution that, that uh, I did find uh, is, is quite old. So this is a, a paper, I think, from uh, 2011 about um, solving the same problem that I'm going to describe. Uh, the thing is that they solve it for the semi-honest um, setting, while I'm going to assume more of like a real-world malicious security. And um, I do want to also like, just say that this paper is, is important because it teaches us quite a lot of interesting uh, things. So one thing is that they introduce a uh, solution based on PSI, the private set intersection, which is interesting. The other thing is that um, they introduce the notion of security, which needs to last only for the duration of the game. So if a game lasts one hour, you don't really need all that much bits of security. It's enough to have security just so that it will not break for the duration of the game. Um, now, if I talked about cheating, now we need to talk about anti-cheating. And uh, as uh, I pointed out, we are not living in a perfect world. Anti-cheating is still an open problem. And we can divide anti-cheating solutions into two parts. Like there's the server side and there's client side. And later we're talking about multiple games. So on the server side, uh, what we have is uh, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, where there are no cheats, uh, if, if there is uh, some non cheating game, so you want to have some logic somewhere that catches uh, the cheater and then ban them from the game. Um, and you also want to uh, replay or to run different parts of the game, um, kind of like as a server, you have this, uh, this ability to, uh, to do stuff uh, that, custom, that, that users cannot do, and then kind of like check, check that uh, some game logic is, is indeed uh, intact. On the client side, um, there is uh, basically uh, some methods that are highly intrusive, right? So uh, kind of like violating a lot of like privacy uh, of, of users, you need high-level uh, uh, 
you need kernel level access uh, to, to machine and, and basically you know what happens is that in many multiplayer games for efficiency you want to share the state of the game or in, in memory so you keep uh, very sensitive stuff on memory in memory that you don't really want people to tamper with uh, or to um, or to even read okay therefore you need these like protections like integrity checks and encryptions and our goal which uh, I written in uh, is written in a very uh, small font um, by design is to try and solve cheating with cryptography. Right, so it's very ambitious, um, and basically the game plan is to do something a bit different. So instead of putting all of this mechanism in place and trying to catch different ways of cheating, just let um, the user, the gamer, to say uh, to show that no cheating happened. Right, just to prove in a way that uh, the game was uh, played honestly. So I talked about cheating, we talked about anti-cheating, now I want to talk about uh, what happens uh, in, in real life. And uh, while it is indeed a very uh, painful problem, there is a solution for, for cheating, right? And, and this is uh, a deterministic game engine. So what happens in a deterministic game engine, basically each, ga each gamer can run, uh, each player can run the, uh, the entire game, the entire computation locally. I think about it. The only thing you need is the inputs from uh, the other participants, and other than that, you can like simulate the entire game. So it means that if uh, a cheater decides that now he it moves faster in some way, um, it doesn't really reflect into what other uh, game gamers uh, want to see. Right? They want to just like run the game as usual. It also means that if there is some kind of a dispute, I say that no, I played according to the rules, but someone claims. I cheated, then we have a, cell, a set of tools. We can um, simulate it in some kind of an environment, and it should be deterministic, um, and we can even do some majority vote if we really want to. Right? And there are certain other ways. Here on the, uh, the image, you can see that there's this, um, it's a modern game engine called Quantum 2 by, by, by Photon. Uh, they have this like part of doing the simulation, and uh, obviously it connects with, with Unity and Unreal and it's uh, provided very fun and engaging uh, user experience. Um, and the problem is that this is not providing you with the actual like, you know, uh, real gaming experience that we want when it comes to uh, modern uh, gaming because it lacks a very important part, which is fog of war. So I want to take uh, a quick detour um, to talk about what is fog of war and connect it and put it in the context of the deterministic game engine and why there's an issue here. So, Obviously, I put the, the dry definition from Wikipedia, but basically, the concept of 404 in gaming talks about hidden information, right? So the first example here is, is poker. Now, the problem with poker is that it's not really a big problem, if a problem at all, in real life scenarios, because by design in the game of poker, we have a dealer, and this dealer is not part, is not any of the, uh, is not a participant, or is kind of like trusted in the sense it's the house, right? So there is no issue, we have a trusted party situation. However, we do have hidden information, right? So every party needs to keep uh, their cards uh, hidden. Another example is the game of Battleship, right? So this is a more interesting example, because it's like uh, a one versus one type of a game. We don't have, uh, we don't have some kind of a trusted uh, dealer, trusted party. So, so this is interesting, right? And, and of course, each, each party would have their own state. Now, if we're in a deterministic game and uh, it means that there's no hidden information or there's uh, only two options for me to do, right? So one is I'm sharing my entire state so everybody can have the same view that I have. Obviously, it makes the game like not interesting um, and it makes it also very easy to, um, uh, to hack because everybody sees uh, the locations of my, um, my pieces. The other way around is by anyone not sharing, and in this case, it's very easy to cheat, because uh, I can just lie, like if someone is asking me in this game, like if I have some piece in, in some location, I can just say no, I don't. I can move it around and so on. If you try to put it in the context of cryptography, you can uh, intuitively think about like a solution that is based on commitments, right? Because you just commit to the board in a way, and then you prove your way in ZK, kind of like that you've done um, whatever it, it needs to be done, right? So that's in a way also an, um, an interesting yet relatively easy thing to reason about. 
a real time strategy game on the other end, this is what I consider here the holy grail. Um, I'm not necessarily the holy grail, but this is more interesting or the most interesting case because now we have hidden information, but it's also kind of like, you know, change, changing over time. Think about location of different units and so on. And that's kind of like the type of games that we want to talk about. Like that's what we want to solve. Concretely, let's take a look at uh, some example, which is going to be a running example. I'm going to use it uh, in the slides uh, later on, which is the Fog of Four Chess. So this is, by the way, taken from chess.com, right? Uh, I did not invent this uh, variant of the game. It's actually uh, very playable. And you can see um, on the left how the game starts. So you see only your side uh, of the board, right? So you have the information. And then as the game progresses, you get this kind of like different view, right? So on the right, you can see that knight uh, can basically uh, see uh, there, there's the pawn that, that uh, can be uh, can take and, and uh, some other like location that uh, the, the knight can move, can, can move into and so on. And this obviously will change. And what's important here is that this is, uh, there's some asymmetry in the information, right? So that's not necessarily the view that the counterparty is seeing, right? So this knight is not necessarily visible to the other party. Okay? So this makes things interesting, right? And it keeps evolving over time. Um, a very interesting game, by the way. If anyone wants to try and play it, you can do it online very, uh, very easy. So here's the idea. Can we take this deterministic game, right, that I argued has a very little to no uh, cheating, and add to it this type of fog of war, doing so with cryptography? What we get is that we have the same guarantees that we have uh, for anti-cheating of deterministic games, but now um, we'll have much more uh, interesting experiences, right? Uh, games that can be built using this asymmetry uh, and needed information. Okay, so now for this part I'm going to do a lot of hand waving. I'm going to basically, my goal is to get you to some level of intuition, and for that I would need to mesh between theory, instantiation, and implementation, okay? So try to bear with me uh, to see kind of like where this leads us. Now, to start, I'm going to just look at, at the game. So this is like the model for us, a deterministic game. No for, for at this point, we'll edit later on. Just try to see what does it mean to have a game, right? So we have a setup, um, some, you know, public parameters and so on, and then uh, we try to, or we're going to make this assumption that, or a couple of assumptions that uh, we can break down any kind of a game, even real-time game, into discrete pieces, uh, discrete chunks of time, so that we can look at it as a round-based uh, protocol, a round-based game. Another thing is that we assume synchronous communication. So if I'm sending a message, it is received immediately uh, for everyone, right? Um, some kind of like simplifying assumptions. Uh, the model would work with any number of any number of of, of, of players, but but we we'll just assume uh, we work with two parties, and uh, each party has some kind of a view that would be uh, allowed to get update uh, every every round. And for each round, we indeed update the view, and then we have a chance to actually interact and send some uh, some input to to the counterpart. Okay, with help of messages. So just to show that this makes sense, let's, let's try to uh, um, instantiate it with the game of, of chess, right? So this is not the Fog of Four chess variant, just chess, right? So here it's, it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, as a setup, what we need is a board, right? We need a board B. Um, we also need to define some game uh, rules, so it can be the regular rules of chess, okay? Uh, in the case of chess, it's also very uh, straightforward that it's already been played as a turn-based game and, and it has two parties, so nothing to be done here. And uh, the user input would be just movement from one point to another. It's very easy to verify because uh, we have one view, which is the board, so it's very easy to verify that the movement was done correctly according to um, what we uh, defined uh, at the set, doing setup. And in this case, even uh, we don't really need interaction, we just have one message in each round, in each direction, okay? So this works fine. Now, let's try to understand what do we need, uh, what are the requirements for the cryptographic fog of four, okay? Now that we want to uh, add on top of this uh, game model. And here I'm already using, like I'm still 
keeping the chess example because I think it's like helped with intuition. So one thing is that uh, we need to add some privacy to the board. So the joint board is no longer a uh, joint view. Now we need to have local views to each party, which makes sense. And um, kind of like, uh, you know, with the, uh, similar to what, what I explained before with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the game of, uh, uh, the previous game is that the ZK part here is, is kind of like uh, um, easy to understand intuitively. So now we have secret user input. So remember there's some asymmetry uh, information. What I'm uh, doing now is not necessarily going to be um, is not necessarily going to be shared with uh, my uh, uh, counterparty. But I do need to add some proof with every movement I'm making every turn. Uh, for consistency and also for correctness, right? So I do want to make sure that my movement now is consistent with all of the history of the game, and also I want to make sure that there is some, um, that it's correct according to the rules of, of the game of, of, of chess in this example, right? So that's kind of like the, um, the ZK part. There is one problem I want to address here, which is the discovery problem, right? So again, I mentioned that this is kind of like very static, but we do need to propagate the game, the state of the game, right? And it, it kind of like runs um, each new round, you need to kind of like set up a new, um, a new environment before you actually get on and do this kind of like ZK, um, uh, ZK stuff. So how do we update securely uh, the views of the player? How do we make sure that like, each turn, each round, both players uh, get to have updated, uh, correct views? And, and yeah, that's, that's the, the, the NPC part. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's, a very, um, uh, it's a very simple NPC in, in the sense that, you know, <laughs> each round will have a uh, local view from one party, local view from the other party, both go into like some NPC, and as a result, in this case, you know, it's P1 turn, of course, it will be the same for, for the other party. As a result, so one party learns nothing, the other party should have some kind of a list of, okay, I can go from here, I can like take this uh, piece, and, and, and so on. All right? So now let's try and take our model, again, instantiated with the chess game, and try to see what exactly we need to change, right? So remember, now we do have this sense of privacy, so now we have local views. And now we need to have this uh, discovery process, so we do need to run this NPC, followed by this kind of uh, ZK proof for correctness and consistency. And uh, what we want, or, or what I'm going to try to explain now in, in a couple of slides, and we'll not go into a uh, deeper level of that, is kind of like how we take this specific part of the NPC and ZK, and try to implement it in some ways that would help us um, with uh, that would be more efficient than, than just doing the, you know, the, the generic uh, naive uh, ZK and MPC. Okay? So let's look at, at what we have. So on the left, we have this MPC that I mentioned before, right? Uh, this, this high level ID. And then uh, the second step would be to do this ZK proof that should be with respect to outputs and to the MPC process. So my claim here is that the, the MPC can be implemented using some special kind of oblivious transfer OT. Uh, this is called bidirectional verifiable OT. Okay? So first, the OT part, and I'm going to again just try to extend the intuition, not how I'm taking multiple of these OTs and, and building a view of my like, new board uh, state. So basically the OT is because we have information symmetry. Remember that one party needs to learn something from the other party, but I cannot really, um, and yeah, I cannot really have the other party learn anything. The bidirectional verifiable come to address the malicious security or malicious adversaries because we need to address two types of attacks. So one is that as a sender, right, and here, uh, basically the sender is, is P2 in this example, can basically just send anything. I can just lie in the OT. Right? I'm asking for some values to learn the state, but like the sender can just tell me whatever they want. Um, and the other thing is that if you think about it, try to think about some real-time strategy game uh, as, as here as the receiver, I can also lie about my position. Right? So I can just ask the sender to send me whatever I want without um, 
any account accountability for where I was before. I, I need to have some consistency here. Okay, so that's kind of like what we introduce. And this allows us to basically achieve uh, um, what we consider a point solution, and that's definitely not the only solution. So just to touch um, at a very high level to, to try and understand what we do here. And uh, yeah, on, on the right, you can see some kind of like the dry definitions for, for DVOT. But basically, we start with some encoding, right? So we have each player um, encoding uh, the state. So in the board of chess, it will be the board uh, and, and the, the exact positions on the board. Specifically, what we do is we use polynomials uh, for the encoding, uh, which would become very uh, useful when, when we go into uh, implementation. We then move to some to-do commitments, and again, for us, it's like polynomial commitments. And, um, and, and these commitments would be uh, updated every, uh, every time that we uh, validate a certain state. Like we've done, we've run this like APC, ZK stuff, now the output would be a new kind of commitment that we can propagate and, and, and walk our way in the next, uh, into the next term. And indeed, the MPC is based on uh, basically many times this uh, BOT. Think about the fact that you need to uh, somehow mask what are you requesting. So there are like certain levels of privacy that you need to achieve it. So that's what I can say about our point solution. Of course, happy to discuss and open up for different ideas. I want to conclude. Uh, with a uh, with few points. All right, so first, in the context of cheating, um, this landscape would be always a straight off between performance and security. That's also where my company um, is trying uh, to make a difference. All right, so the image that you can see um, to, your, to your right is, is from the game of uh, Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike 2, and you see that on the one hand we run the game, on the other hand we run ZK, uh, and this is running on the same GPU. So uh, it's, it's hard to um, infer from this image, but you have to trust me that basically performance are uh, the same as if you run only one of them uh, like standalone, meaning that the graphics of the game remains in touch, remains the same frame per second. Also the ZK part is working as it should, same performance as if it was running alone on the GPU. So I think that there is uh, a room here uh, and that we are um, at a mature enough state to kind of like have this discussion on how we can work with the gaming industry on figuring out this, uh, how to bring cryptography into a, a more dominant part in, in, in their ecosystem. There is an um, interesting point here about client-side technology. So usually, um, or many times, uh, we focus uh, on the server side of things. Here, with gaming, it's uh, almost exclusively running uh, on the client side, right? So this GPU is, is, is a gaming GPU, right? Um, with mobile, by the way, situation is way worse. Like, like the, uh, the things that developers are doing for mobile gaming, it's, it's crazy. It's like it's, it's uh, at like the level of, of embarrassing when it comes to, uh, uh, to do anti-cheating. Uh, there's opportunities even with consoles, right? So consoles are these boxes that basically contains everything you need. Like there's the software, there's the hardware, and there's like, you know, one thing that basically knows everything about it. So it's very easy to think about how to integrate cryptography. Um, the, the P2P uh, aspect, which I didn't really touch. So most of my talk was mostly uh, at the assumption that we have a server and clients. However, once you introduce cryptography, you can easily leap into uh, uh, this type of, 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 of P2P games, which uh, it, it's not new, like many other games, but obviously when it comes, many other games are, are using P2P, uh, although modern multiple games are exclusively doing this server client uh, topology. When you go to, um, to P2P, it opens up different possibilities. You no longer have a server that takes like, no part in the game, right? Um, so it's more financially, uh, it's benefit, there's benefits in, 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 in the way, that, even in the way that it's scaled, right? And, um, and and then blockchains, right? So blockchains is, is another form that uh, another thing that can helps with many things here, like communication, uh, finance, incentives, and so on. Bottom line, this is a work in progress. Um, we're exploring it, and uh, if you are interested, we'd love to collaborate. We try to we actually build games. We try to work with different. Uh, uh, game designers and publishers. So, uh, yeah, if that's interesting. We'd love to uh, be in touch. Thank you.
questions? No, oh, it's a two-party, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but this is working, but a little bit. So, first, this is Counter-Strike, and we are not, we didn't implement here, like, the entire thing, so it's not working yet. Um, what running here is some generic zero knowledge, right? Some kind of, like, simulation of what the zero knowledge would look like, not even the NPC part, right? There are many things that are still unknown at this point. Yeah, because the NPC, this would require a multi-party computation protocol, right? Yeah. And do you think that the games that you described, uh, you introduced Lego Legends before, to such games that are like highly intense and highly reliant, do you think it's, it's possible? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's 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 possible, and uh, we've been we've been in, ch in touch with it. For example, Counter Strike, we've been in, in, in touch with, with uh, uh, the guys that kind of like maintaining this game. Uh, specifically Counter-Strike, by the way, the least for one, the code is open source, so you can really see kind of like a lot of the anti-cheating that they are, are doing. And for example, in this game, you see that um, a lot of the logic is kind of like happening all the yeah. Like the game is being played in a way that the server is kind of like a police officer. It's like running like all the logic for everyone. And um, it creates efficiency problems. Like these games, while you are not feeling it in, in like, you know, uh, your gaming experience, there are like there is some meat that you can kind of like you know eat through uh, and, and still have enough of like performance. Right? They are not efficient games uh, to begin with, right? So I do you know there are a lot of tricks that you can do. In Counter Strike, but also in Lego Legends. So I don't look specifically on, on Lego Legends, but, but I assume that like design is like, similar in a sense. Um, you can also think about you know the anti-cheating. It really depends on the use case. So, for example, in an eSport type of a game, you might want to just replay the game, or you, you kind of like save locally a lot of like the stuff that you need to later on approve, and then you can like replay the same stuff and do it offline if you want. Like you can take the computation to like a different time, like not necessarily concurrent with the game if if you want to. There yeah, might be ideas like this. If you think about uh, compromising. Leaking information for uh, anti cheating in what you play. So, uh, uh, it was not clear. But let's say that you, you design this protocol in a way that I will leak information that is private for me to you, um, but you can never do a, a move that you can't do. Uh, and this might be, it might allow you more freedom in designing it. But I don't know, because now you have this, this state where you can, uh, you can act. Not accordingly, not, not honestly, right? And I'm, I'm suggesting switching that into a state where you would have information that you could somehow maybe access um, that would give you some some advantage, but might be better than what is formed here. Yeah. So if, if I get to a point, uh, it's it did not black and white. Like like uh, it's a constant struggle, and it's really a matter of uh, this trade that I talked about of security and performance and whether you want to be there. Um, when you talk with anti-cheating teams of, uh, you know, of the publisher of, of League of Legends, uh, of Valve, and so on, you do see that they care a lot about anti-cheating, but but it's always like uh, changing. And, and what we are, by the way, what we are trying to do uh, when we talk to them is actually like nail this exact point where they say, okay, this is like you know where we need help, where we need more tools, and kind of like introduce uh, an enhanced toolbox that might be useful for them. Personally, uh, we haven't found yet the sweet spot, right? Like exactly. Uh, what it's like, how is it that cryptography can integrate with this like very AAA, you know, state of the art games? I just assume that this might happen, and I agree with you that it's not going to be just like a provide, you know, the perfect solution, and uh, it's going to be both like super secure, super performant. It's like you're not going to be the case. <laughs>